Welcome to the Virtual Spring Meeting 2020, brought to you by the American Bar Association Antitrust Law Section. The Spring Meeting is the section's premier event, a multi-day celebration of learning and camaraderie. The Virtual Spring Meeting brings together the world's leading experts on competition, consumer protection, and privacy law, discussing the most compelling issues of the day. Enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to the Virtual Spring Meeting. My name is John Roberti, and today we have a great panel. It is called Chair at the Table diversity in litigation. And the panel is sponsored by uh, the Civil Practice and Procedure Committee, the Membership Diversity and Inclusion Committee, the Women Connected Committee, and the Special Operations Team on Leadership Development for Members. With me today, I have uh, three really great uh, experts who are going to give us a little bit of context around today's uh, panel. Uh, first, Megan Hollywood is a partner at the Robbins Kaplan Law Firm and is a vice chair of the Global uh, Private Litigation Committee at the uh, Antitrust Law Section. Hi, Megan. Hey, John. Great to be here. Great. Well, thanks for coming. Uh, Jim Taraji is attorney advisor in the Office of Policy Planning at the Federal Trade Commission and a co-chair of the Membership, Diversity, and Inclusion Committees. Hi, Jim. Hi, how are you? Good, Jim. Thanks for coming. And Ricardo Woolery is a an associate at Skadden. He is also one of the co-hosts on the Our Curious Amalgam podcast. And Ricardo just came off a very grueling trial. Uh, Ricardo, it is good to see you. Good to see you as well, John. All right. And, um, and maybe, Ricardo, let's start with you. Um, what's today's panel about? Today's panel um, is focused on at least three things. One, what's the value of diversity and, inclus and inclusion in litigation work environments? Uh, two, uh, what does diversity look like in these environments among lawyers? And three, how can we go about increasing the efficacy of some of these diverse and inclusive inclusion initiatives in these work environments? Really important stuff. Jim, um, let me go to you. Why is, why is today's panel important? Well, the panel is important because diversity and inclusion is an issue that we have in the legal profession, number one, and therefore it's an issue within the American Bar Association and the antitrust law section. It is really a societal issue. It's a problem that we have in, in, in the workforce that we don't have sufficient diversity and inclusion is a factor that really brings it all together that says we want everybody involved, we want everybody view of the world and, and the, what they can add based on their background and experience. Jim, thank you. Uh, and Megan, what are we hoping to get out of today's panel? You know, today's panel is such a, a really uh, talented group of women who have been extremely successful in their legal careers. And so um, in tackling these really important issues and talking about their own experiences and their own pathways to success, I hope that um, that we walk away and, and particularly the younger, diverse and female attorneys watch, watching this will walk away with some practical advice for how to navigate their own careers and, and for all of us really to be thinking about how to promote and, um, and enhance diversity in litigation, uh, particularly given these challenging times. Megan, thank you. Um, so um, will you three please stick around with me? Let's watch this panel together and then let's come back at the end and maybe we can talk a little bit about the takeaways. Uh, is that okay? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds good. Great. Okay. So um, let's send it down to the panel. Jody Williams is the moderator. She is. She also put this panel together. Jody, the floor is yours. Thanks, John, and thanks everyone for joining us for this virtual spring meeting panel, Chair at the Table, Diversity and Litigation. As the title suggests, this panel is devoted to talking about both the current state of diversity and litigation, as well as what we collectively can do to increase and enhance diversity efforts. Now, as you all know, we're conducting this panel virtually instead of together in a conference room at spring meeting, and we're doing that for a reason. 
Studies have shown that members of diverse groups and diversity initiatives in general tend to suffer during global crises like the coronavirus pandemic many of us are dealing with right now. So we saved some time at the end of our panel to talk about what we all can do to make sure that recent diversity efforts do not fall by the wayside. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jody Williams and I am the lucky moderator for today's panel. I am the co-chair of the newly formed Women.Connected Committee for the Antitrust Section, along with Gabrielle Kohlmeyer. My other day job is as legal counsel for Qualcomm, where I'm the antitrust compliance lead for our licensing business unit, Qualcomm Technology Licensing. With me today is an esteemed panel of women, each of whom is a success and inspiration in their own right. I feel so privileged to have gotten to know each of these women as we've gone through the process of putting this panel together. Judge Bernice Donald, Wendy Wasmer, Megan Jones, and Professor Sarah Redfield, welcome to the panel and thank you so much for joining me today. Now, rather than listen to me give your bios and rave and go on and on about each of you, which I could do for probably the whole time of this panel, I thought our audience would appreciate each of you introducing yourselves and also giving us a little discussion and highlights of your pathways to success. Judge Donald, let's start with you. Good afternoon. Um, Jody. thank you very much for moderating this wonderful panel and thank the antitrust section uh, for giving us this opportunity. Uh, I am uh, Bernice Bowie Donald, a judge on the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. I want to uh, begin with a caveat because one of the things that I tell people when I speak is that every individual defines success for him or herself. And it's not necessarily defined by the label or the position that one occupies. Yet, uh, I feel honored to be on the Court of Appeals, so I am gonna talk about my pathway to that point. Uh, I began my career as a public interest, public service uh, lawyer, first with uh, Memphis Area Legal Services and then as a county public defender. I had a brief stint in private practice and because I have always abhorred injustice, uh, when I witnessed what I perceived to be injustice, I decided to do something about it. It was a bold move, but I decided that as a judge, uh, I could have uh, an impact and I could help define um, and add dignity to the space around me and for those coming into courts where their views of justice were being established. And so, I ran for judge and I was successful uh, as a county court judge. Uh, I stayed in that position for about six years and then I um, applied for uh, a position that was 180 degrees out, uh, a position on the United States Bankruptcy Court as a federal Article I judge. And uh, while I didn't get it the first time, uh, I was persistent. And the second time around, I was selected. Uh, in 1995, President William Jefferson Clinton appointed me to, uh, or nominated me, I should say, to the U.S. District Court in Western Tennessee. And uh, I was confirmed uh, fairly quickly. I stayed in that position as a district court judge for about 15 years. Uh, and uh, in 2010, President Obama nominated me for the Court of Appeals, and uh, I was fortunate to be confirmed, and that is where I serve right now. Uh, and I will talk a little bit more about that because in the process of getting to this place, there are some lessons that I learned that I want to share with uh, uh, our audience uh, that I believe are uh, important wherever one is and wherever one hopes to go. Uh, so that's my brief introduction for my journey to the U.S. Court of Appeals. Well, thank you for that. And I'm really looking forward to hearing more about your path um, as we continue our conversation. Wendy, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. And so glad to be here. So I'm currently um, an antitrust and litigation partner at Wilson Sonsini, but I'll give kind of a brief background of how I got there. Um, what I find somewhat funny is that people say to me, oh, you're such a lawyer. What I would say is I actually didn't um, start out thinking I would be one. And when my parents first met the judge who I clerked for, um, he asked them, um, 
whether they thought I was always going to be a lawyer. And I think they said that they thought I was going to either be an artist or a social worker. So <laughs> you come from many different paths. Um, I come to private practice um, by route of being having been in the government for the first half of my career. So I was a law clerk. I was an assistant U.S. attorney in the SDNY, and then I was in the DOJ antitrust division, and collectively that was about 10 years. And then I made the transition to private practice, and I've been a um, partner in private practice doing um, defense and plaintiff side work. I'd spend a lot of my time doing kind of crisis government investigations, but I also litigate in federal court a lot, which I know is, is the topic today. And to pick up on um, what Judge Donald had said, I think that the definition of success to me, which of course is reflected on all the folks who are on this call, is really, I feel like I'm at a place where I, I do work that I like and I work with people who I think are incredibly talented. So I've never had a thought that there was a specific job that I had to get to, even though I know that in the legal profession, that's kind of a, a thought sometimes. But I think what I view as success is we're really doing something that we think is meaningful and we have great colleagues. So thanks for having me today. Thanks for being here. Uh, Megan, do you wanna introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Megan Jones and I'm a partner at Hausfeld. I do plaintiff side class action work and I have for 20 years. Um, my definition of success um, in this field is um, getting to work with people that you like on matters that you like. Um, and I think that that has um, been a real achievement in the plaintiff's bar. Um, we have made room for people um, to get experience. Um, and I'm happy to talk about how that happened and the specifics and my personal journey. Thanks, Megan. Um, and I can personally say it's been a pleasure to work with you in my previous life on the plaintiff side of things. Um, Sarah, do you want to go ahead and give us your background and tell us how you achieved the success that you have today? Thank you. I joined the rest of my colleagues here saying what an honor and a joy it is to be part of this program, working with obviously talented, successful, smart, magnificent women. Uh, I started this journey, I'm an only child. I went to local public high schools. I was the first in my family to go to college and certainly the first in my family to go to law school. Along that way, we didn't know a lawyer, so it was all new territory for me. Along that way, I was also always um, either the single woman as an only child or among e and half or more women, I went to a women's college. And then I went to work in the Maine Attorney General's office. I'm from Maine, and where I was the second woman ever to work for the Attorney General. And I was the first woman to appear in many courts in the state. So it was a rude awakening for me to go from being the treasured, cherished only child to the real world where I was pretty much always invisible or always told where I couldn't be. So I began there and I spent the first part of my legal career at the Attorney General's office and then I decided to become a teacher and spent most of my career as a law professor at the University of New Hampshire where I saw 50% uh, of my classes eventually be women. And I thought that was that. Right, we'd done what we all set out to do. There would be no more first women in the main attorney general's office. Women would have their place and take their place. And it's only much later in my career that I came to see it was not so simple, that that was not how it was, and that our progress to taking an equal place in the profession has been very slow and has not been achieved. And so I know I'm gonna talk more about this with some of the other points we get to. I can't resist, however, opening with this story based on the title of this program, A Chair at the Table. So there's this marvelous piece of research about the significance of what chair you sit in at the table. So it won't surprise you all to know that if you sit in uh, the head of the table, everybody thinks you're in charge, unless you're a woman. So if a man comes into a meeting and sits at the head of the table, everyone thinks he's in charge. If a woman comes into a meeting and sits at the head of the table, this is all assuming people don't all know each other, and sits at the head of the table, people look around to see who's in charge. So I think it's a great title for this program 
and I'm looking forward to being part of it. Thanks, Sarah. And that actually provides a great segue into our first topic, which is to talk about the current state of women in the legal field and the current diversity balance. Megan, do you want to start us off and give us the lay of the land and the current state of what our diversity balance is? Yes. I thought it would help to anchor our discussion by starting with data. Um, so let's start with law firms. Um, there's a great McKinsey study that notes that women make up just 21.5% of law firm partners and 18% of equity and managing partners. Um, women of color represent about 3% of equity partners. The same study found that women are 29% less likely to reach the first level of partnership um, than men. It also found that um, law firms face higher attrition among women than men at the equity partnership. So even when women obtain equity partnership, um, they, there's an attrition problem with them staying at law firms. Um, attrition is highest for women of color. Um, about 75% of women depart their law firm by their fifth year and 85% before their seventh year. Um, for in-house counsel in the United States, women make up about 31% of gen the general counsel population, according to data from the general counsel survey on LinkedIn. Um, in law school, since about 2014, uh, uh, women have been 49.3% um, of incoming class. So the pipeline problem is getting better. On um, judges, uh, from the bench, women hold only about one out of four every federal and state court judgeship. For MDL counsel, which is my world where I live, um, with the, which is you know who gets appointed lead counsel in antitrust class actions, um, from 2011 to 2016, women made up on average 17% of all lead counsel appointments. For law school professorships, out, um, women up, occupy about 30% um, uh, of professorships and 31% of deanships. And given all this, it is not surprising what we see play out in the courtroom. Um, the New York State Bar Association did a great study in 2017 and found that female attorneys um, accounted for just 25% of the speaking roles in commercial and criminal cases in courts across the state. Um, this, this ratio did not vary among upstate and downstate, federal and civil, trial and appellate, criminal um, ex parte applications. It, it pretty much held the line across all matters. And so you can see the data reflects um, that we need more chairs or a bigger table for diverse and uh, female attorneys at all levels of the law. Right, and so you talk about all levels of the law and those numbers, while they may be shocking, they're also at the same time, I don't think to anybody on this panel, they're particularly surprising. Um, why, we, we're talking today about litigation and why diversity is so important in litigation. You talked about this a little bit, but can you expand on why having a diverse legal team is so important in a litigation setting? Yes. In the corporate context, there's been a lot of studies done. One is the Peterson Institute for International Economics, and they determined that a 30% increase in female leadership um, within the organization was associated with a 15 increase percent in, in revenue. And if you export that to the law firm model, I don't think there's any law firm that would turn down a 15 percent increase in revenue. And so I think there's a profitable motive as, as well as um, you know, there, the Fortune 500 companies um, with the highest percentage of female boards similarly had a return on invested capital nearly 66% higher than companies with lower female participation. For the legal profession, um, it leaves almost 50% of our talent pool unharnessed. It ignores the wants and needs of clients and for diverse legal teams. It ignores the diversity of jury pools when cases go to trial. And for both moral and profitable reasons, um, diversity matters. It does matter. And so sticking with the litigation setting, Judge Donald, have you seen changes in the gender makeup of lead counsel in your courtroom? And if you have, what do you attribute to the change? 
and if you haven't, what could we be doing? What more do we need to be doing to make it a more balanced courtroom? Sure. I completely agree with Megan, and, and I must admit, I have been around the legal profession for a, a long time. I'll start by saying that I worked and actually was president of the American Bar Foundation, a research organization, and the Commission on Women of the American Bar Association uh, actually um, had the uh, American Bar Foundation do a research, on, pardon me, do a, a research project on women as lead counsel. And as Megan said, women as lead counsel were very much underrepresented. Uh, it was more of a problem uh, some time ago, but it still remains a huge problem. And part of this, I think, is rooted in um, who we see as lawyers and what we think the qualities of lawyers ought to be from the general public's perspective. I believe that there has been some change. Obviously, the, the pipeline is fuller now. I think uh, law school classes are now more than 50% women. So women have been practicing for far longer than they had when I first um, uh, came into practice. But there's still a, um, uh, a, a gap. Um, I was in the criminal setting for a while and almost all of the, the lawyers who came in on major cases were, were women. And I think that reflected the public stereotypical belief that if you, need, if you had a tough job, if you had liberty at stake, you needed a tough lawyer. And they translated that as male to be on the, to be the, the head of that, that team. So women in, in especially high profile or white collar crime were primarily men. And those are the cases where the fees and things obviously were going to be higher. On the civil side, women were also underrepresented. Women, I believe, if you look at it, were uh, very well represented, uh, but not at, not at, at, at parity in government um, uh, jobs uh, as uh, line prosecutors, uh, but not as um, the heads of those units. And that has changed a lot more now that there are more women in the, in the pool. So I think there has been change, but as Professor Redfield said, that change has been very slow. I think that we have got to encourage um, uh, and uh, U.S. attorneys and state uh, prosecutors to look uh, at women and to increase their numbers. But also I think we've got to have more women step forward and head those operations. I had to run for office. A lot of DAs and AGs are elected. And sometimes I think women have to go out and, and run for those, and then they have to help increase that pool. So there is a lot to be done. Um, there's a saying that you can't be what you don't see. Uh, and people, corporations, law firms, and the public, and judges, and appointing authorities have to see more women in those positions because they reflect what our society looks like. And as Megan said already, they bring value. There is real val value in having a diverse uh, team. It's not some feel-good notion. It's not some benevolent uh, notion. There is a business case. And I, I believe that when people look at outcomes, uh, they can see the value that women bring and hopefully will acknowledge and reward that value by increasing the numbers. Very true. And so Sarah, Judge Donald just said, you can't be what you don't see. So I wanna ask you in your studies, have you found systemic challenges that are slowing the, the diversity balance or that are preventing women and members of diverse groups from reaching the top ranks in their organizations? Maybe I can just say yes and stop speaking. Uh, it, it's hard not to find that. And uh, I mean, we listened to Megan's numbers and thank you for providing that data, which I think is really critical. And as I was listening to you, of course, I was thinking about law professors. And I want to point out that that data and the numbers are just the first layer. You also have to ask, and as in law firms, what jobs do these women have? What percentage are they of the whole population? But what jobs do they have? Sometimes women professors, especially those who teach legal writing call themselves the pink ghetto of the law school. So 
we need to be a little more maybe in depth in our analysis of the data, but we need that data. And I also want to thank Megan for pointing out all the studies that show us how good women are, right? It, we make business more profitable. We make investigations come out more correctly. There's lots of data on this, lots of studies that show this. So as good as we all are, as much as the data shows that, we have to, again, ask ourselves why our success in the practice of law in the field of law isn't better. Why so many of our colleagues, our women colleagues, leave the practice from all of the different kinds of practices we know about. So those are the questions. And so what's the systemic answer? Well, the stereotypes have not left us. And that's a simple way of putting what we perceive when we look at women and we contrast that as the judge was suggesting with our image of a successful tough lawyer. And so what does that all mean? It's hard to understand. I like to try to think about it maybe in a, take a step back and think about it in a um, setting different from lawyers just to give us a little break from blaming ourselves or examining ourselves too closely. There's a new study that was done by a um, researcher, uh, Rupam Acharya and colleagues that analyzed, to be ready for this, they analyzed the TED Talks. So they used the TED Talks as a database to understand how people perceived, well, so we're supposed to be smart on the, with it, presenting important information, things that could change society, all the things that TED Talks has said it's trying to do. And this will come as no surprise to you. When they did that, who was graded as most confidently beautiful, most, conf most confidently courageous in their talks? Men, not women. So here's a platform that sells the world that's out there to improve uh, society and be global in its openness. But when it's used as a data set, what it shows us is the same kind of response we see to women attorneys. So this is a big deal. It's omnipresent in society, starts early, stays with us, hard to break. Uh, so sure, you want me to answer how we're going to fix it? That would, that would be good. Um, but I think programs like this are one way we're going to fix it. We're going to start talking about it. We're going to start calling things by their real names. We're going to start telling the truth to each other. We're going to start blaming each other. And we're going to try to learn about the implicit bias that those stereotypes are reflecting. Great. And so, Wendy, I want to turn to you and ask, are you seeing some of the um, implications of implicit bias on the defense side of things? And how, in your tenure at Wilson Sonsini, have you seen the diversity balance change in a good way, in a bad way? Um, give us an overview of what, what opportunities and challenges you're facing. Yeah, I'm happy to. So what I would say is what's interesting is when I joined Wilson Sonsini, I really joined not for diversity purposes, but then realized that we were much more diverse. And I would say the difference where I currently work is that the dialogue is much more frank than, it, than it's been at any point. In part, I think because, you know, when you're in the government, it's a little bit difficult because especially if you're a chief or your supervisor, really the laws are different with regard to government. So you, can, you, can't, you can't have the discussion in the same way maybe that you can have in the private sector. Um, I think that my group that I work with is more diverse from a women and diverse lawyer perspective that I've ever worked um, with in like 20 years of, you know, doing law. And what I'd say is, you know, I would give a lot of credit to the plaintiff bar in antitrust for doing a ton on diversity. My anecdotal experience, although, you know, you all will know the numbers better is that the plaintiff bar is much more diverse in terms of women, at least leading than I've seen in the defense bar. And I'll just give two anecdotes. If you kind of, I was thinking as we came into this call that um, I, do, I do criminal defense at individuals in corporate and in my criminal defense practice, the grand majority of people I've represented are men. And I had my first female representation last year and it was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. But I mean, there's a reality to that in terms of the people who are under investigation. And I think primarily they're picking men to represent them. And then on my matters that are in federal court litigation, or let's say like a corporate DOJ representation, um, I am typically not only the only diverse person on as a lead counsel, but I'm the only woman. And so I'll have calls, in fact, I had calls today, where it'll be, you know, let's just say 10 to 12 different law firms, 
and the lead counsel is is a man and a not, not a diverse man. And so like the, and the, the women are involved at various levels, but they're not the lead person. So um, I think in terms of your question about implicit bias, I really thought a lot about that in the past few years, especially in private practice. And I, what I would say is I do think a lot of bias plays into the selection of counsel. Um, what I see a ton is that you have pitches go forward with diverse companies or clients where there's some per perception behind the scenes that maybe the woman lawyer isn't gonna be, isn't gonna have the court presence or isn't gonna be a big enough personality. And I will say where I've been hired for lead counsel roles, the feedback is often really similar. It's you have a big personality or we think you're gonna be aggressive or there's, there's very specific feedback about what they're viewing me as. And I think some of that has a gender overtone. It just happens that I'm kind of a bossy person, but I do think people, whether it's diverse or women lawyers, may be at this kind of unconscious disadvantage where exactly as I think that you know, was previously said, um, there's a view about who the central casting lawyer is, who's the lead. And my experience has been you need all types of leads. And for certain cases, yes, you need a certain personality type. And, and sometimes the client fit is the man or woman, but I think when I pitch for cases, I, I am up against implicit bias every time. And I think it's getting better, but I'm, I'm aware of that typically that someone's gonna be saying, well, she's, she looks younger than she actually is, or she's maybe not, other, she seems like she's more um, collaborative than we want. And, and I guess my take on that is, well, if that's the case, you don't hire me. <laughs> but I think it goes on all the time in the kind of defense bar. So thank you for that. And, and so, with all the implicit bias we've been talking about and um, not seeing ourselves in the roles that we've been taking on, you all have managed to achieve tremendous success in your careers. And we talked about that a little bit at the beginning. Can you each take a few moments and give us what the secret to your sauce is? Um, talk about how, what, how you've made it work. So Judge Donald, let's talk with you or start with you. Certainly, but I, I first want to just comment on something Wendy said where um, I, it's anecdotal, but I saw this play out because sometimes I think people are, are punished for these actions of tokenism when they're not really sincerely embracing diversity. As a federal trial judge, I had the occasion of presiding over uh, an employment discrimination uh, case and the, uh, the firm representing the defendant uh, brought in a, a woman to sit at the table. Uh, they never had her do one thing. She didn't make a motion. She didn't examine a witness. She was just there uh, for a gender representation. I think the jury looked at that and, and, and saw right through it. Um, they decided the case on the facts. They uh, gave an award for the plaintiff, and it was a pretty substantial award. And later on, um, the, the head of the company was a friend, and so he and I talked about it. And he said, you know, if he could do that all over again, he would have just brought in a regular team, and, or he would have gotten the woman to actually be an active participant in the trial, because he thought that this um, just being there for show really hurt them. So I, I think we have to be real, we have to be intentional, but we have to be honest. Uh, because when we're not, I believe people see through that. Now, uh, getting back to what, what's, what's the, um, the ingredient, I, I think uh, as we will hear, it's different for everyone else. But one of the things I have to say, we have to be confident in who we are and our ability to do what we uh, need to do. I, I, I didn't talk about my personal background, but I didn't come from uh, a family of professionals. I came from a really humble background. But the one thing uh, my mother taught me early on, because we grew up in the segregated South, she told us, each one of us, that you are as good as anyone else, but you're no better than anyone else. And she told us that sometimes we were gonna have to stand alone. But as long as we took a principal stand, then it was okay to stand along. So I think we have to be confident in our abilities. We have to be, we have to know who we are, but we have to also be honest with ourselves. We should not take on uh, projects unless we're willing to follow through. Uh, we have to know our limits, know our strengths, and confront our weaknesses. So I think it's important to do that. Uh, I think it's important not to surround yourself 
with everyone or only with people who look like you and think like you. Some of my biggest mentors and sponsors uh, have been male. I believe it's important to reach out to people who are already either at the place you want to go or at least headed in that direction. Embrace them and make sure that you reach out for help. Uh, don't be afraid to self-promote. I think sometimes we think that self-promotion is um, a derogatory term, but who knows what we're capable of better than we do. And so if there's a task that uh, we want uh, and we know we can do it, speak up. I also believe that we have to be willing sometimes to sign up for the, the work that's not glamorous, maybe in an area that we didn't, that's not really our first love, but sometimes it is that being able to take that task that nobody else wanted to do and develop an expertise there that allows you later on to capitalize and become an expert in that area. I think about bankruptcy. I've heard a number of people tell me, well, when I went to the firm, uh, this particular case came up and they said, okay, you know, who wants to do this? Nobody really wanted it. So they put it off on the new person. That person built an expertise and later on uh, became a, a leading uh, attorney in that field of work. Uh, I, have, I have stepped out. I've taken a chance. Uh, I think one thing that we need to be careful of as women that we don't um, limit uh, ourselves. I think sometimes we can have this habit of, of looking at the, the criteria and saying, oh, I fit, or I can check boxes one through five and seven through 10, but I can't do um, uh, six. And so I just won't, I won't go for this because I don't meet every box. Men don't look at it that way. They look at it and, and maybe they don't necessarily meet that, but they say, I can do this. And so we have to be willing to say, I can do that. We have to be willing also to possibly be rejected the first time. I was when I applied for bankruptcy uh, judge, but I didn't embrace that non-selection. I stepped out again. And sometimes there can be pain, but um, what do they say in the sports world? No pain, no gain. Uh, so for me, it's been being willing to be uncomfortable, being willing to speak up, being willing to embrace the things that have not been popular and being willing to look and, and seek help uh, from people uh, who necessarily uh, may not have been the person that I thought would have helped me. I will say this one thing, the person who, who called me and championed me for the position I'm in now was somebody that I, just looking at him, I would never have thought that he would have been my personal champion. I didn't really know him that well, uh, but he called me and said, there's going to be a position on the, on the appellate court. And we have been talking. We think you ought to go for this. And that was an older white male lawyer from Nashville who was not my friend, but somebody who apparently who had watched me and who knew what I was capable of. So sometimes it's not the person that we might think of first uh, who, who is going to be our champion or who's going to be our sponsor or our advocate, but it might be that person uh, that we never, that it really uh, came to our mind. So, so the other thing I will say is it has so, been so important for me to be involved in organizations. My involvement in the American Bar Association, my involvement in, in uh, the antitrust section, my involvement in other sections has really been a huge value for me. Uh, you know, all politics may be local, but all of your network of friends should not be local. So that's, that's part of mine. I, I thank you for those comments. And the last comment you made about having your network be global rather than local, I couldn't agree more. Uh, Wendy, do you want to talk about your tips and tricks and secret sauce? Yeah, I'm happy to. So it's interesting. I feel like the tips for success may change over time. So I think early on when I first became a lawyer, it was almost like it really is like truly like tips for survival. <laughs> and I think a lot of what Judge Donald said is true, which is, you know, I felt like I worked really hard and I had a good attitude and I, you know, tried to um, be somewhat resilient. I think I was just trying not to take myself too seriously and just do day by day. And I think the biggest 
kind of six point of success I've had is that as, at a certain point in my career, I think I started to make my own decisions. I basically started to figure out, do I really, do I like what I'm doing? What, what do, what would I like to do with my legal career? What am I, what's going to be meaningful to me? Who do I want to work with? And at a certain stage of a career, and I think to the extent we see attrition and we see um, women or di diverse lawyers leaving the profession or kind of leaving at stages, which I think we talked about before, I've asked people who are leaving at various stages, like what would have made a difference for you? Like, you know, I just would love to hear it. And in some ways, I think the theme has been really consistent, which is just feeling like there's a lack of control. Like I'm not gonna get promoted or I don't like what I'm doing and I'm not supported. And it's almost like a feeling like you can't design your own destiny. And while of course, it's not like we can control everything that happens in a legal career, what I often find is people stay longer if they think that at least they have some role in shaping what they're doing. And for me, I think it was probably maybe like the eight, nine, tenth year of being a lawyer. I was kind of burned out. I, I had loved my time in government, but I really needed to be asking myself, like, what would I like to do going forward? And I think that's probably the stage where people leave the profession and they're like, I've just had it. I'm not going to do law. I'm going to go, you know, have a farm somewhere, which is obviously also lovely. But I think I, what I realized is I like to be around incredibly talented people, whether it's in public service or the private sector, who are really passionate about what they do, who think that their work is meaningful, and who are team builders. And I'm not so worried about revenue. Um, I'm happy to be in the private sector, but I kind of listed the things I wanted out of my career at that point and almost did it like a stop. And since then, I think I've had much more purpose in what I'm doing. And I think I'm staying in the profession and liking it more because of that. And so what I, what I say to folks, especially women and diverse attorneys who are ha maybe feeling like they're not getting as much out of their legal careers as they want and maybe just not in love with what they're doing, is the first question I say is, okay, well, what do you want to be doing? <laughs> do you like these cases? Do you hate these cases? Do you have the role you want? And if you don't, why is that the case? Is it because you don't have enough experience? Is it because you're working with the wrong person? Do you need to make a career shift? So I think, and this goes back to you know, the question you, you know, posed before to Professor Redfield is, what can we do? And I think part of what we can do to make people more successful is ask those questions and then help, help draw out what the next plan is for them and help them, make, help them understand that if they do the hard work, if they think about it, if they're team players, they can actually shape their legal career, you know, in a way that's really positive for them rather than feeling like their career's almost controlling them or ruining their personal lives, which I hear a lot. Megan, um, I saw you, I don't know if our audience could see you, but I saw you nodding a lot to what Wendy was saying. Do you have similar experiences or, or what, what were your tricks? Yeah, um, I was. And, um, you know, I, like Judge Donald, um, come from humble background, public school, K through JD, or my, I did. And, um, uh, and I also worked at a temporary agency during college in the North Carolina factories. So I had a different boss every week. Um, I had a different computer system. I had a different floor manager and that, that kind of prepared me for the law. Um, because law partners have nothing on factory managers. <laughs> I'm being tough to work for. Um, but the, the thing that I took from that was if I wasn't valuable as a team member, I could go away. They would just replace me with the next temp worker. And so I decided early on, I was going to be the most valuable team member I could be on any litigation team and hang on for dear life. And, um, and much like Wendy, you know, when she said survival, that's when I was like, preach. Um, because, you know, when you're in a litigation team, the, the verb is apt. Um, and so I decided as a, as a young litigator, I wasn't going away. And even though I was the only woman in the room and the only woman in the courtroom and I was arguing my motion from the jury pool because no one would make space for me at the table, um, I decided I was gonna, I was gonna, I was gonna stay. Um, and the thing that made me uh, really agree with what Wendy said was the, the lack of control. It, you know, it can be very isolating if you're the only one over and over and over again. Um, and there's no one like you and you don't see anyone to model after. And so early on in my career, which I think helped was I decided I was going to do it in an authentic way to me. 
and I wasn't going to model my career after blustery uh, personalities um, or pound the table. Um, anyone who's seen me do a cross-examination knows I'm quite effective when I need to be, but I decided that I was going to litigate and conduct myself with professional courtesy in a way that felt comfortable to me. And I wasn't gonna cross that line just to fit in. And that helped me, that gave me staying power. I also agree with Judge Donald, ask for the ball. Um, that if you wanna take the deposition, you're like, I looked, I spent three weeks getting the documents and I wrote the outline and now I'm handing you the binder. You know, ask to take the deposition. They won't say yes every single time. Um, but every once in a while they will. And, it's, and, it, and so I think um, I encourage women litigators to ask. Um, and then I think the last bit of advice is, and I learned this later, um, and I, I, I wish if there was one thing that women take away um, from this call is mistakes and failure is not fatal. There is not a litigator that has not lost an argument or flubbed a question. Um, and I think women sometimes hold themselves up to be to a perfectionist standard, and I don't think that's necessary. Um, and so uh, I encourage women to, you know, be themselves, don't leave, ask for the ball, and um, realize that, you know, some of my best lessons have come from failure. When I had a witness go sideways, and I'm like, I will never do that again. Um, or you have a, um, a class certification brief and you think that argument is just perfection and the judge doesn't buy it. And you, and you realize, you know, that there may be other ways to do different things. And so, and you learn and you get better. And so that, that I think would be the four takeaways um, in my career. I love that. Um, yeah, I, People who know me personally know that I rarely can have a conversation without bringing my kids into it. And apparently this is no exception um, because everything you're talking about, we talk with our children and we call it a growth mindset, right? So always having that growth mindset of, yes, you're going to fail. You're going to make a mistake. And it's, sometimes it could be small and sometimes it's going to be huge. And so let's, let's learn from that and let's grow from that. And I love that. Um, Sarah, Professor Redfield, you have had a bit of a different experience from us having gone into academia. What, uh, how have you made it work to achieve success? Well, I guess I would start by saying that I would have made it work a lot better had I known any one of you or certainly all of you when I was beginning my career. So one of my uh, empty spaces in my career was that I didn't have a mentor. I didn't have somebody I could ask for advice. I didn't have the opportunity to listen to videos like this and hear other women who'd gone different routes to their successes talking. So that said, when I saw this question on the outline, I said, oh dear, what am I going to talk about? So I would say this, that um, it's important to know your strengths and believe in your strengths. And if you have to beg, borrow, or steal somebody who's going to tell you that you're good at what you're doing, you have to find that person. If you have to beg, borrow, or steal somebody who's going to tell you you're not crazy in the situation you're in, then go look for that person. Um, I had a, this is an anecdote that I'm only going to alter a little bit for the story value, but I had an experience not getting along well with someone um, at my law school, not uncommon among faculties, I'm sure that won't surprise you, but it was very serious for me and very difficult and I was feeling far less than successful and I decided I was going to try to find someone who knew this person outside of my law school who could just give me a little feedback about how I might better work with him, be on his team, those kinds of things. And so I did that. I called a former dean of his. And deans are hard to get. You know, you usually have to go through their administrative people. You have to wait. You have to make an appointment. You get five minutes. And I, but when I told this dean's assistant what it was I wanted to talk about, that dean was on the phone in one second. 
And when she got on the phone, she said, I started to say, I don't really know you. I appreciate you talking to me. Um, but she cut me right off and she said, I know you don't know me. And here's what I want to tell you. You are not crazy. <laughs> so that was such an enormous gift to me, right? And so the ability or the willingness to try to find some place that can validate your reality rather than be totally subsumed in it when it's not positive for you is a really important um, skill. And I guess I would say to, in addition to that, is something I came to later in my career, it's not always about you. So remarks people would make that were um, praising somebody else's work, but not mine, uh, not calling on me to do important jobs at a law school, whatever those might be, um, but always calling on my male colleagues to do them. All those kinds of small messages that we call in the implicit bias room, micro messages, all those kinds of messages maybe aren't about you. In fact, they're probably not about you. They're probably far more about the person who's sending the message and how he or she, but mostly he, perceives his world and responds to those who are in his in-group and like him. So learning that whole vocabulary about micro-messaging and who's in your group and who isn't has been really helpful to me. So I recommend that uh, folks do that. They learn the vocabulary as a way to distance themselves from what otherwise might be a negative and career inhibiting message. So I guess I'd close by saying there's always learning and this kind of learning from other women who've been this path before you can be really powerful. Thank you. And again, you're providing me with a great segue because we're talking about continuing to learn. Um, and so I want to switch gears a little bit, go back to something um, Judge Donald mentioned earlier, which is that we have to be honest with ourselves. We have to be honest and authentic in our diversity initiatives. And we've seen various initiatives to promote diversity implemented recently, um, the Me Too movement and open letters from general counsel about the need to have more diverse legal teams. What I want to hear from all of you about what your take is on whether these initiatives have been successful. So, Professor Redfield, turning back to you, what have you seen in your research that's particularly effective? So, I like your questions because I can just answer them with one word. I said yes before, but then I went on talking. Now I'm going to say no. Um, so, when I look at the history of these kind of blue ribbon things, you know, the studies, the Blue Ribbon Commissions, the reports, the, the initiatives, the um, pledges, all these things. They've been around now for a, a fairly long time, at least as you measure it in the legal profession's history, and they have not been particularly successful. So then you have to look for what is going to be successful. And I think I would say in the legal community, there most we are mostly motivated by either making a profit, being highly respected, how it maybe does two things. And so things that are going to be successful have to show folks, initiatives that are going to be successful have to show folks that it's good for their business, it's good for their reputations, they will be respected for what they do. And I think for me, one of the ways to do that is to get people to be aware of what they're actually doing and whether what they're actually doing is consistent with what they say they want to do. And again, I'm coming back to my field, which is implicit bias, but the significant thing here is that we all are biased, we're human, we're biased, but those biases may well be completely, completely inconsistent with our stated view. So for someone who says, I want to be the lead partner, the head of, the director of, whatever it is, of an organization that is truly committed to diversity and advances all diversity and equity and inclusion and access, for that person, I believe that person, but that person may not understand what his or her implicit messaging is. So I want to do all those things, but I'm always going to hire the person who, if you will, for shorthand, looks like me. 
the one who went to my school, the one who was the different team I do, whatever the look like me definition is at the moment. So for me, I think what's successful and what research is slowly showing us is successful is teaching people ways to understand that difference between their implicit indirect response to something and what they explicitly are trying to do. Uh, so I am a big advocate of that kind of implicit bias training where we all learn what our group dynamics are and how they're impacting us every day. Megan, what's your take on what Professor Redfield just said? Do you agree? Do you disagree? Do you have a different perspective? Coming, coming from the private bar, um, I, I largely agree because numbers don't lie. And I think, you know, that 18% num that number for equity partners has been there for 20 years. Um, and so I, I think that what I find inspiring and what gives me hope is that um, we can create solutions ourselves. Um, an example is when I started way back when in the plaintiff's bar and I was the only woman in the, in the room, I started a conference um, for women antitrust plaintiff's lawyers to, to find them and to network, network with them and to grow business. Um, and it worked. And the first year there was 18 people. That was it across the entire United States. Um, for uh, women in the plaintiff's bar. Um, and now the, at the last conference we had, there's 80. Um, and so, you know, I encourage women as we obtain our own levels of success um, to create systems that we wish we had. Um, I couldn't agree more about finding the, um, the advisory board that you can call when you're having a tough day and say, is this me or is this fair? Um, and having those friends you can reach out to. They do not need to be at your own firm. Um, they can be external. Um, and so I think as more women um, obtain uh, power and stay in the profession, um, we will create systems that would have kept us in, if that makes sense. And that gives me, that inspires me because you know I think um, having something external to women litigators try to solve the problem, um, has had limited success. And I think as there are more and more women managing partners, more women on the compensation committee, more um, uh, discussion about who gets origination credit. Um, you know, if you're taking uh, me to a pitch meeting um, and it, uh, am I gonna get origination credit or is just the person who got the meeting? Um, and so I think that there's a larger conversation that we can have um, amongst ourselves um, that may try to move some of these numbers that we heard at the beginning of the call. Wendy, what about you? Do you have a similar take on whether these initiatives have been successful? Yeah, so you probably, you'll see vigorous nodding as, as Megan was talking. So, you know, I think that the initiatives that I've seen are very good in communicating inclusiveness. I don't think they work with regard to the problem of not having enough senior diverse lawyers or women in power positions, for example, in law firms. I think the government is actually doing better in that in certain administrations <laughs> than private practice. And so what I think needs to be done, and I'm kind of on a mission on this, um, and to Megan's point, so on, at our firm, I'm on the compens compensation, the partner compensation committee for the firm. And it's been a really good education in addition to the day-to-day -day kind of business development we all do. But um, it's been great learning that I pass on to, you know, any lawyer who wants to hear about it, diverse or non-diverse, about how to kind of develop their profiles and, and what will matter in terms of compensation. But, you know, I'd say a huge piece too is my closest friend at my firm is also the co-chair of the member nominating committee, so the partner making committee. And we have a lot of conversations about what's happening in the seventh, eighth, ninth, 10th year of being a lawyer where we're losing diverse lawyers and women. And what I see, and there are many answers to this, but chronically what I see is that we're not preparing lawyers at that stage to do business development, to do client service, to own matters. Either we're not preparing them or they think they can't do it. And so they're either, they actually can't and then they don't you know, pr get promoted or they don't become an equity partner or they actually can do it, but they have a confidence issue and they're like, I'm not, I'm not cut out for this. So what I 
firmly believe has to be done is I do think we have to figure out very early, just as this is really private sector, how to teach skills where diverse and women lawyers do not find this intimidating. And I'll give you a quick anecdote on this. They understand they can business develop and serve clients and grow their practices in the way that works for them. It doesn't have to be the way it always was. They work to their own positives and their own advantages. And I think this goes back to what everyone on this call is saying. They have confidence because it's really authentic and it's them. And so I'll, I'll give you a quick anecdote. So we, I often worry that because I come from a much more traditional kind of prosecutor background that I don't want associates who work with me to think that they have to have the same route that I do. And they don't have to have the same interests and they don't have to socialize the same way that I do. And I'll give my firm a lot of credit for the fact that there's not one way that people socialize. And it's not like you become, you, you get promoted because you play golf with X person. But there is a dynamic that I see where those interests, those common interests do matter in the law. And I think social, there's, we can't deny that there's a social aspect to the law that helps you if it kind of works for you. So I recently was talking to a few associates and I said, how many of you are super intimidated by the idea that you can't business develop unless you play golf? And all of them raised their hand. Like, and I basically said, you know, half the partners at all the law firms who play golf are terrible at golf. <laughs> it's just that they're doing something that they kind of like to do with someone else who kind of likes to do that. And what I said to them is, look, I play golf, but I'm like, would never use those skills to try to impress a client. <laughs> so, so I, that's not my path. My path is that people who have hired me and clients who like to work with me know me from the government or they've known me from a long time and they see what I can do or they feel like I'm a personality fit for them. And so that, that isn't the way I connect with people work-wise. And so what can we do to have you feel like you've got a toolkit where you can actually make use of what, what you're great at or how you, know, how you can connect with people? And I think once they realize that you can be a non-scotch drinking, non-golf playing you know, lawyer at a senior level who has their own interests um, and still be a great business developer, I think we will see more people in the equity partner ranks are kind of making their own practices um, and not kind of um, not stepping out before the right moment. It sounds like the consensus from this group is that these big magnanimous diversity efforts are really, while they're, they're bold in their ideas, they're not um, implemented well or at least not consistently throughout the country and throughout various law firms um, or, or globally, even for that matter. So what I'm curious to know, Judge Donald, from you is even though the big initiatives maybe aren't working as much as well as we would like them to, smaller diversity initiatives, more individualized in diversity initiatives are. So are you seeing those smaller initiatives translate into more substantive roles or, or larger substantive roles for women and members of diverse groups in your courtroom? Judy, I want to enlarge the question and ask people to think about this concept. The constant drip of water on stone. You know, you think water is not a natural tool that cuts or imprints stone. But over time, that constant drip will, in fact, make an imprint and it will cut through. I think that, and I'm, you know, I, 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 we've all learned the lessons of, of, of Brown and all deliberate speed. Um, I think all of these things are important. We might not be able to see results right away, uh, but I think they are important. And I want to give a couple of antidotes and then I want to come back to what you, you asked me. I think about the federal judiciary now. In 1980, only 5% of the federal judiciary was uh, made up of women judges. In 2019, according to the statistics from the Federal Judicial Center, I believe it's now between 25 and 27. That didn't just happen. I mean, this happened because of awareness and advocacy and more uh, people putting themselves forward. It came from having uh, people who are in positions of authority recognize that there is value in uh, diversity. I remember the National Association of Women Judges uh, having as one of its primary goals to get a woman on the US Supreme Court. 
Well, we finally did get a woman, uh, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. Uh, and now it, we have three women. Hopefully there will come a day when we will have nine women on the U.S. Supreme Court. But, you know, we, things are, are incremental. I go back to, and I'm glad to hear people mention women of color, because according to Professor David Wilkins, women of color are really leaving uh, law firms at, uh, at, at an alarming rate. They are not going for the brass ring necessarily of partnership or whatever. As the track to partnership has become longer, people are making different choices. Uh, I hear from women of color that uh, in many firms, they're not getting the mentorship, they're not getting the types of assignments that are really going to showcase their, uh, their abilities or that are really going to lead them to uh, the ultimate uh, uh, partnership status. And so people are making choices that, you know, if, if this is not going to be attainable, you know, I, I'm going to leave. Or they're just deciding, as somebody said before, this is not what I wake up wanting to do every day. And so I think there's a value to having choices. But I think we do have to remember that, that there you know, there is um, an investment when we bring people in and we ought to really nurture that investment and build on it and help people find a place that they want to grow, contribute and, and stay. The other thing I would say, when we're talking about diversity, I know we're talking about women right now, but I also want to, to um, uh, put in a plug for diversity in a broader sense. Um, talking about the pathways to the federal bench, uh, we seem to have gotten to a point now over the past few years that if people wanted to become a federal judge, they needed to either come from a, uh, a corporate law firm or they needed to have been uh, a federal prosecutor. We need broad diversity. We need government attorneys, public interest lawyers, people who are sitting on the bench deciding all of these cases they need to have these broad backgrounds. We need people who come from an antitrust background, a criminal defense, as well as a prosecution background. All of that is, is important, and we need to acknowledge that. Uh, I want to just uh, make mention of the Commission on Women and the American Bar Association. They have done huge uh, research projects through the American Bar Foundation, through Women as Leaders projects, I think those things are important. And I think Professor Redfield adverted to that in her comments. It brings successful women together to share their stories and also to mentor other people who may want to go where these women uh, are going. And so those things in combination, I believe, help. I want to, um, again, just talk about a personal project that I uh, was involved in uh, uh, creating, and it's called the Spirit of Excellence Project. My view was that lawyers of color know about majority lawyers, uh, and the legal profession even today is still not terribly diverse from a racial or ethnic standpoint. Uh, we're doing better when we, we talk about women, but still those numbers are way, way low when we look at where we are and our makeup in, the, um, in law schools and as young attorneys. But I found that we really didn't have a way for lawyers of color, women or otherwise, to showcase their contributions and their talents. And so I chair at the commission, at that time it was called the Commission on Opportunities for, for uh, Minorities in the Profession. I, I spearheaded the creation of a project called the Spirit of Excellence Project, which showcases the contributions and the talents uh, and the advances for uh, lawyers of color. And, and I think that's important because we have to understand the history, the, the talent, uh, and sometimes the, the journey. One project that that, um, that uh, commission spearheaded, and I was not the chair at that time, Dennis Archer was, but at that time we found that lawyers of color were not getting the same opportunities in corporate law firms that uh, their white counterparts were. And so they created something called the Minority, Demonst the Minority Council Demonstration Project. They got seven corporations to buy into it and agree that in a um, closed environment, they would give work to uh, lawyers of color to prove that lawyers of color could do this work if given an opportunity. And, and while there was not a, a similar project for uh, women necessarily, I think women have gone through that same proving ground in terms of helping um, 
partners, helping uh, firms, helping corporations see that if given the opportunity, women could do that job and they would do an incredible job of it. Uh, we're still in that proving ground, as I think Professor Redfield said, and we're still facing some of those same obstacles that our for, uh, forebears uh, in the profession face. But I believe that the more awareness, the more um, uh, diversity of projects that we can do, they may not yield the results we want right now, but I don't think they do harm. So I say, let's continue and remember that concept water on stone. We may not see it right now, but eventually as the numbers keep going and as we keep making advances, I think we will see the fruit of our efforts, the fruit of our labors uh, being mirrored in, uh, in the future. So in, in the interest of time and, and on that note, um, with the initiatives that have been going on, I want to move to current events and, and what's recently impacting us all and why we're all doing this webinar or this panel on video cams as opposed to in a conference room together. Um, and as I mentioned, when we started this, there are reports that show that diversity initiatives struggle during global crises. Um, and right now with us all working from home, we've dramatically altered how we interact with each other personally and professionally. Um, so I want to talk with each of you about what you're seeing the challenges of, of a stay-at-home workforce can present in a litigation context and talk about and and as we close our session today uh, leave our viewers with some practical tips of things that we can all do uh, men women members of diverse color um, what everyone can do to make sure that the the indentations the water has made so far that they won't dissipate um, so I'm going to turn this over to Professor Redfield first to get a uh, perspective from academia. So, I, it's, it's a hard question. We don't know the answers, so I'm not pretending, obviously, that I know the answers. Uh, there was a recent piece that um, Karen Stacy wrote. She's the head of the Diversity Lab, and the title of it is called Double Down on Diversity Data double down on diversity and she reviews what you've just said jody the history of who got hit the hardest in the recession diversity really suffered um it was the diverse folks who were let go first all the kinds of things that we would hope to avoid now so her idea of double down on diversity i think is really critical i think what's in common on all of us is to if you will says the professor do our homework to understand that these kinds of situations not this one is unique but still these kinds of situations where pressure is put on our usual structures which frankly weren't all that perfect before um is going to demand that we all stand up and look around and be aware of what's happening and not let um, our quick preferences, our group preferences, our instinct to take care of our own and help our own uh, take control. But I think we all have to stand up for that. We all have to be ready to call things by their names and say what we see is happening both in the present and historically and to make sure that our colleagues are not adversely adversely impacted by that and uh, i would end by pointing out something that megan you had in your notes but you haven't talked about yet um and that is the importance of accountability so we started with megan giving us really straight up data and i think it's now upon us to keep track of that data to be accountable for the decisions we make to watch their impact individually and collectively on our institutional structures and so i'm going to give everybody a few little tips on accountability okay um how do you know when something's accountable well one thing is you have to say it to somebody else right so it's not just your own little decision make it another person is present or involved in a decision makes you more accountable when your role your individual role as a decision maker is identifiable in a decision you don't just say oh the committee decided it was a joint decision 
No, you ha when you understand that your role is going to be identifiable, you're more accountable. When you think you are going to be evaluated for your decision, is there some place in the public sphere or in your own firm or institution where somebody's going to say, well, she or he didn't really follow the guidelines on diversity. She or he didn't watch out for this. That's the um, other one. And the one that I think is, I've saved for last sort of on this research, because I think it's really simple and we could all be doing it is when a decision is made, let's require people to give the reason for their decision. Out loud or in writing. I mean, the judge is familiar with this. She has to do this all the time for every decision. But most of us don't have to do that. Um, so I think if we took those tips to heart and remembered the context in which we find ourselves, I think we could, even in this surreal new world we're living in, turn some advantage instead of disadvantage. And, and to follow that up, you know, I, I, uh, I wrote it down because it's important. And there's this, I have this great, um, this, this quote that gives me a lot of comfort, the violet in the mountains broke the rocks. Um, and so I just want, you know, as we talk about this really hard issue, we don't have to solve it with a hammer. Um, and it doesn't have to be something um, enormous. And so one of the things that I, when, I, when Jody asked me, what is the one thing that you would say practically can help move the needle and you can't measure what you don't measure and that's why you know i think it's so important um, that firms keep lists of who goes to business pitches and then all of a sudden you can see who's invited and who's not and that's not a political decision that's data um, you can keep lists of who takes depositions you can measure that at your own firm i know in my cases when i'm lead counsel i measure the diversity of who takes depositions on my teams. And you can see that if something needs to be adjusted, and that goes to experience, race, gender, um, you know, it's really important to make a pipeline for new attorneys to get deposition experience. And so I think it's really important when we look at an issue this big and this complex and this intractable um, is that data can help and it can help you have a harder conversation. So, you know, for example, if you, you're in a, a law firm review and they say, um, we're, we're concerned about your ability to develop business, um, you can also take a look and say, look at the list of business pitches that have gone on and you may not be on that. And that's data. And you can say, well, I'd like to go. And, it's, and so what, what I wanna do is encourage women in a way that, um, I do not underestimate how diplomatic and hard it is um, to make space for ourselves. And so one way to do it in a, in a very um, objective way is to measure. And, that, and I encourage you all at your own firms to kind of input, input uh, put into place those systems. Megan, I wanna, I was gonna ask you, um, speaking of our conversation when we were prepping, when we were talking about this topic in particular, you brought up the concept of hard work and that nothing really can beat hard work in showcasing your talent. And I responded to you, very true, but it's very easy when we're all in this work remote situation for your hard work to be faithless. So what, what can we do to combat the facelessness and make sure that we are receiving recognition? Judge Donald, you talked earlier about self-promotion, but self-promotion is hard when you're not in a conference room with somebody, um, you're not seeing them in the hallways, you can't share your successes contemporaneously as they're going on, you know, see your boss and say, hey, I just had this great client pitch, it went wonderful, let me give you the download. That Those opportunities, we just don't have them right now. So. Megan and, and Wendy, I'll ask you the same question. What can we do now to make sure that our hard work is being seen? One is I wanna give um, the listeners of this um, podcast and this, this series, um, it's okay to take credit for your own work. Um, I had a great day in court today, here's what happened. Um, I think that it's also okay to um, use your mentor um, to help prom promote what you've done. 
Um, sometimes, you know, there's a whole theory. Um, uh, uh, it's called the prove it again theory. Oh, you had a great result in gender studies. You had a great result this time, prove it again. Oh, you, you got a great deposition, prove it again. Um, and so, you know, you can, by having someone that was external to the process saying, Wendy did an amazing direct examination today. I saw it, it was incredible. Um, I, I also think that it's okay um, to take credit for your own work um, when you are proposing uh, uh, the capstone of that project. For example, um, to tell someone, I, I spent two weeks getting the documents, I wrote the outline, I'd like to take the deposition. Um, I think that women have to do that. I think we have to ask for the work. Um, but I'll throw it to Wendy for anything else she thinks we should add to that list. But take credit and it's okay to say um, uh, you did a good job. Yeah, 100% agree. I mean, I think while we're all kind of all out of the office and trying to cope, I, I see this as a person by person. That person to person touch is really important. And so what I'm trying to do, there's two things I, I, I kind of said to myself, I'm going to do this. So I'm really trying to reach out to colleagues, associates, staff, um, especially diverse and women lawyers and staff who I think are not going to call me and so and see how they're doing. And, and I found really that lots of folks will not proactively reach out. So that's kind of one of my list of to do's is to see how they're doing, see what, whether there's something I can do. The other thing is, I know we're, we're now on a ton of Zoom conferences and, and conference calls, and I see the same issues that we're talking about at all of the firms that I deal with. And, and there's a common theme, which is that there is an amazing female or diverse senior associate who's doing all the work at the other firms too. <laughs> and so what I love doing is saying, let's say that was like Megan or Wendy, I'd be like, Megan at the other firm, that was a great point you just made when none of the people on that other side do that. So I think there's ways that we can call out, even if it's not our own team, like I make, a, make it a, you know, a, a plan and I always try to call out to the client when there's multiple lawyers who is doing the work on the other side and say, hey, this amazing associate, this woman associate, this diverse associate did all of this draft. I want you to know that. And it's, you know, there's like zero cost to anyone. It's actually quite fun to, to, to call out great work on these calls and to make sure that um, people are recognized. And I do, I will say, since there was some, I think there was some funny commercial ones that ran where it's like, a conference room of men and someone, the woman says the, the, the pertinent thing and then someone says, oh, Bob, great idea. I see that all the time. <laughs> it's literally, I thought that was actually a joke. I was like, oh, that can't happen. And, and now in most of my matters, I see this happening every day. And so I really do try, even though it sounds a little bit like, you know, um, a little bit ridiculous that I'm like trying to do this all the time. I, I really try to call out the woman or diverse attorney that's done a great job because it's not happening enough. I agree. And I would just add to that, I think what you both are saying, you know, making sure that you're making it known, sending the email, picking up the phone, giving the call, uh, making the shout out, a lot of those things we should be doing normally and we don't perhaps because they feel uncomfortable. And so, you know, maybe my message to our, our viewers right now is nothing feels comfortable, right? Everything we're doing is new, this whole work setup, nothing feels comfortable. So embrace it and embrace the discomfort and be bold and, you know, send that email or pick up the phone and make the call because that's, we need to do that even more so now than we have in the past. Um, and my last question before we wrap this all up, Judge Donald, I'm gonna throw this over to you. Um, a lot of younger lawyers get the opportunities by being a second chair in a courtroom. They, you know, they happen to be around when a, a more senior attorney is running off to the courthouse and they say, hey, can I come with you? Or, you know, and, and that opportunity arises just natural in the hallways and that's another, aspect of, of, of work that we're missing right now, especially because motions and hearings are now all being conducted on a video conference. And I, while I have not partaken in any of the litigation efforts so far, um, it wouldn't surprise me to hear that the video conferences are being limited to only those arguing for obvious reasons, such as you wanna limit background noise. And it's difficult enough to gather two or three conference lines together, or two or three phones, and so then to expand it out to the junior associate that you would normally bring creates 
a whole host of logistical issues that you just can't deal with. So what tips do you have for those younger lawyers out there to somehow create those virtual opportunities while we're all working remotely? Wow, Jody, that's a, that's a tough question because we are in a brave new world and you know, nothing that we're doing right now is normal and we're sort of going at it for the first time and courts are uh, experiencing and grappling with all of these issues. I mean, for the most part um, in our circuit right now, we're having very few oral arguments. Things that we had set, uh, we're now going to on the briefs or are we, you know, maybe having just a, just a couple. So it is uh, different, but this is going to pass. And when it does, I think for young lawyers, if you want to get before the appellate court, you know, courts are looking for uh, firms to take on pro bono cases. We recognize in the Sixth Circuit, at least, that if a firm expends the, um, the capital of having a young lawyer uh, come in on an appellate argument, we will automatically give oral argument to that case because the firm is making um, an investment to train young lawyers. I would encourage um, people to, to come and, and uh, you, you observe if you, if you can. I know that time is valuable and they have, have billable hours, but um, for right now, it, it's just a difficult, uh, difficult situation. And I really don't have an answer, but I do want to say this. Uh, I want to say amen to what you said, Jody, and what the others have said. Uh, wherever we are, give somebody else um, a hand. Uh, I mean, give them a compliment, help them. Uh, it's going to come back to you. Celebrate and congratulate. There's a lawyer, uh, there are probably many of them, but there's one on whose mailing list I appear. I get a newsletter all the time of his big wins, and I don't get anything about the losses, but, you know, he lets the world know, you know, I'm good. Um, he doesn't necessarily give people on his team credit, but I think we have to, as somebody else said before, celebrate, congratulate, uh, embrace, and really promote um, women because that helps. And uh, it's that kind of thing that uh, doesn't cost us anything, but we need to start doing that. And you know, the things that are driving us right now, and not just in this space, but in the world, I mean, the profession is changing globalization, technology, and diversity are the big drivers. And uh, we're not going to ever go back to the old way. I mean, parts of what we're having to do now are going to become institutionalized. And uh, I'm not sure how uh, that is going to play out, but I know that in the profession, clients are making more demands, they're cutting costs, uh, and it's changing how we practice and and who's going to be doing that? So I would say that um, we're all in a new space. We're learning, and we just have to hang in there. Well, thank you. And and on that note, I feel like that is the perfect note for us to conclude our panel. Um, so I just want to say thank you again to each of you for participating and speaking about these very important topics, especially right now. Um, so with that, thank you again. And John, I'll hand it back to you. Jody, thank you. Um, wow, that was impressive stuff. Um, so, um, Jim, let's start with you. Uh, can you share some of your uh, takeaways from today's panel? Jody and her excellent panel was about three things. Number one, networking. What are the things that are important in the profession, particularly if you're a litigator? One, networking, getting to know and meet people like you and bringing people who are interested in, in litigation and in the practice of law together as a group so that they so there is that strength factor that comes into play by aggregating the variety of people the other thing that i think was important was a discussion about pipeline talking all the way from law students to uh young young attorneys who are new to the practice to seasoned professionals. And, and ultimately, I think the, the, the mentoring is the last factor that I think is critically important in this whole area that um, young lawyers need to have the opportunity to meet and relate to more seasoned professionals 
and seasoned professionals need the opportunity to pay forward and give the benefit of their background and experience to the young law students and young lawyers. Ricardo, your thoughts? Uh, I agree with Jim. Um, uh, and I'll add a couple more, more takeaways that, that really uh, resonated with me. Uh, so one was for more diverse um, attorneys, uh, don't limit yourself. Feel free to self-promote um, and know that there is potentially great reward in taking the initiative to do work that a lot of other folks uh, uh, either don't have the time or the inclination to do. On the back end, there could be significant payoffs for you if you don't limit yourself and you're free to, and, 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 and you're willing to self-promote. Um, two, uh, you must take control of your career. So you've got to figure out uh, what you like to do um, and make intentional decisions about moving your career forward. Uh, and third, you know, maintain a growth mindset. Um, you know, mistakes and failure are not fatal. They are instead opportunities to learn and to grow. Megan, what do you what do you think? What are your thoughts about today's panel? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Ricardo and Jim and, and just kind of um, coming off of what Ricardo said. I mean, I think I was thinking about this in terms of, of change and and some of the things that the panelists were talking about um, where we talked about how the, when we look at the current state of, of the legal community in terms of diversity, there's been some change, but that change has been slow and, and, and we need to see more of it. And, and how do we do that? And, and so one of the takeaways for me is that I think change really comes from, from different places. It comes from the firms and from the organizations who are willing to change and who are committed to diversity. But I also, you know, kind of what Ricardo was talking about also sort of comes from within. And, and I think the panelists really gave some really great advice in terms of how to take ownership of your career and, and sort of do it in a way that makes you comfortable and, and also comports with your own style. And, and um, you know, you don't have to be, I mean, they were talking a bit about how you don't have to necessarily be that that really aggressive litigator right in the courtroom who's the pit bull or or maybe the the rainmaker out on the golf course um, maybe you're doing those things in a different way and that's okay and you can do that and be successful and I think that's really important for us to hear um, and I, I think it's also important um, thinking about it from from the organizational from the leadership standpoint um, in terms of making space for for different styles and and so when i think just more broadly about the title of this presentation chair at the table and i think you heard megan talk about um you know in, in terms of change we need more seats and we need a or or maybe we need a bigger table and i think we also need to be encouraging our attorneys to take a seat at the table and and take that take on that ownership and um, particularly now given everything that's going on um, you know it, it people are tending to maybe get lost in the shuffle a bit and so we need to be mindful of that and really be accountable uh, one of my big reactions is I just I'm, I'm now a big judge Donald fan I think she's really cool um, and uh, I guess my some of my learning is that um, you know there's a lot of uh, there, there, there are a lot of studies that talk about when you want to solve problems, having different points of view helps you to solve problems. You know, there are a lot, there also is research coming out that's, that talks about, do you want to have better compliance? Having diversity actually correlates with, uh, with better compliance. So lots of really good issues to, to think about um, coming off of this panel. I want to open up. Yeah, I'm Ricardo. talking about. Um, yeah, Megan, go, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, what are your thoughts? I, 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 just, I just wanted to say, uh, talking about Judge Don. Um, you know, it just, it really resonated with me when she said, uh, you can't be what, what you don't see. And so it's just sort of thinking about that and thinking about that in terms of um, looking, what are we, what are we looking toward? And, and you know, you're, you're sort of, these are your role models and, and what are they look like? And, and maybe they don't look like you and, and, you know, that's okay. You know, you could sort of forge your own path either way. And it's just, um, you know, just sort of thinking about her saying that was just, was really inspiring to just sort of, you know, hear her say that, but then also sort of to hear her own path. Yeah. Carter, do you have any, any, uh, any further thoughts? Absolutely. A uh, couple, 
a couple of thoughts. One, one, and I'll start with one on uh, Judge Donald. Thought it was it was striking to to hear her description of her own path, and and it struck me as though it was important to know that you've got to be not only ambitious but you've got to be persistent. This is someone who, you know, as as a county court judge, uh, you know, dared to dream of becoming a bankruptcy court judge, uh, um, and she applied, but when she didn't get it the first time, she applied again. She was persistent. So I think you know um, there, there, there's a lot of inspiration to 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 to, to, to be drawn from Judge Donald's story. Um, in addition to that, to, to Megan's point about um, you know what are some of the, the takeaways and messages for um, institutions and individuals uh, who already have a seat at that proverbial table? Um, uh, I would say the discussion about implicit bias implicit bias is important. Um, uh, it's 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 critical that organizations and folks in power. Um, you know, recognize that implicit bias is real and take some time and expend some resources in, in becoming more aware of implicit bias and being very intentional about pushing back against that implicit bias when it manifests itself in their organizations and in their work groups. Um, uh, another thing was, uh, you know, organizations um, should, should definitely uh, invest more resources in data-driven uh, methodical approaches um, to measuring and correcting uh, uh, deficiencies in their diversity and inclusion um, programs. Ricardo, that's, that's very helpful. Thank you. And I want to ask Jim a question about his committee. But before I do that, I just want to, uh, Megan, Ricardo, any last thoughts? Um, you know, I, I just think this was such a great panel. And, and I'm really just I'm, I'm really honored to kind of just be here um, today to talk about it. Um, it's really important. Megan, Ricardo, thanks. I, I want to turn to Jim for a second because I, I want to learn a little bit more about what the section's membership and diversity and inclusion committee is up to and, and uh, some of their activities. So Jim, what's, what's, what's going on with your committee? Sure. If you don't mind, let me make a couple of comments about what I saw on the panel. Oh yeah, uh, I for sure. The, the Women Connected Committee is fantastic. They used to be part of the membership, diversity, and inclusion committee and Jody and and uh, and her team wound up creating such a wonderful opportunity to for for women in the practice that uh, the council decided with our strong uh, endorsement that it should be a separate committee. The other thing that I looked liked about the panel today was the fact that they made a very strong point about uh, with diversity and inclusion, you're bringing in people. Who can provide a different perspective because if you're always hiring people who are like you you're not adding anything you're just increasing what you already know and diversity and inclusion brings a whole different talent experience and perspective that winds up being beneficial so let me talk a little bit about the membership diversity and inclusion committee uh, we're focusing again as i mentioned earlier on the pipeline we're looking at law students and, uh, and functions at law schools. We're looking at young lawyers, and we're looking at more senior lawyers and what they can do. Uh, in the law schools, we're trying to incent uh, young, young law students who maybe are not fully aware of all the uh, scope of practice opportunities that are out there. So we're letting, letting them know that there are opportunities in the antitrust field in the consumer protection and privacy fields. And so we have a program where we, we, we go out there and offer panel discussions at the various law schools talking about why antitrust and, and getting them interested in that as a career potential. Um, we also offer a mentorship program for, for as I mentioned before, for young uh, law students and for young lawyers who just came into the profession, giving them the opportunity to connect with more senior practitioners. And that is the, the third element, to get the more senior practitioners involved in paying back and dealing with uh, the young lawyers in, in, the, uh, in the section, in the antitrust section, uh, to make sure that uh, they, they show that this is a very active and, and inclusive environment, both for women for diverse uh, uh, attorneys of color and, and for those 
the LGBTQ community. So uh, we're focusing on all of those and uh, we're improving the, the section, we're improving the bar association and we're improving the, our practice and hopefully we're improving society. Jim, thank you. Uh, real, very helpful and, and, uh, and good information today. Megan, Ricardo, Jim, thank you very much. Great context. Also great, some great thoughts on, the, on, the, on how to maybe think about some of the issues that came up. Very, very helpful. Um, before I continue, I, I also ought to explain, um, when we were planning the in-person spring meeting, there had been a plan for folks to wear red as a community building uh, exercise around uh, Women Connected. I had a red sweater I wanted to I wanted to wear today. This was my chance, so that's why I'm wearing the red sweater. Um, I also want to thank uh, the panelists, Jody Williams, uh, all the other panelists who worked so hard. It was a great panel. A lot of thought went into it, and most importantly, I want to thank folks who are watching. Thanks for giving us this chance. Thanks for uh, thanks for uh, tuning in, and until next time, please be safe and be well. <laughs>